What about now? I can hear you now. I've been having some weird issues. I just got a new computer for the podcast. <laughs> and it gives it's, gr <laughs> it's great for typing on Word. Because, okay, so like when I word processing, the bullets key is on the keyboard. So it's great, but. Oh, that's nice. I've had, to, yeah, like you can highlight text, underline everything. It's got this, you can share stuff. It's got this magical little space bar up above the numbers it does all sorts of cool stuff thurman there he is yes. Yes. thurman i tried to dress like you today i got a vest on i got the button up <laughs> yes right. I just, i'm under i'm underdressed <laughs> no no you're not everyone normal. should be dressing like thurman that's the key it really does play well for you man every time i see you i'm like you and Josh Wilson, very similar for me. I'm like, those dudes got swag. Well, we were rocking it back in the day. So. Yeah, you wore full suits to high school. Yes, yes, we did. And uh, <laughs> if anybody else does that, I'm sorry. Man, yeah. Yeah, so ha hey, it's good to see you guys. How y'all doing? Sorry for the delays. I've been having uh, some weird technological issues. I'm using my AirPods, not my microphone. So anyway, uh, so yeah, let's jump right in. Lost Cause Myth Through Film Part 2, Gettysburg and Gods and Generals. Been looking forward. First of all, I can't believe you guys made me watch Gods and Generals. It was rough. That was bad. And even, I, I will say like, I like history, I love movies. But I feel like both of these films were made by Civil War buffs for Civil War buffs because a lot of it I did not understand. I had to do a lot of independent research. What were so I had like a lot of my comments are gonna be like cinematic driven. Like I thought it was kind of appalling that like Stonewall Jackson was also Pickett the actor <laughs> like there was some continuity issues for me and jeff daniel you know he didn't look the same in gods and generals as he did in gettysburg get older but fun fact right is that um russell crowe was originally cast to be stonewall jackson in gods and Generals, but I that fell through so that's why stephen lang ended up being uh Oh, Wall Jackson in the film, even though he was George Pickett in Gettysburg. So, just think, Ten years what apart. What could have been, you know, what, what could have been. Why wouldn't they just, like, cast someone else, though? That's what I don't get, because it is confusing continuity to be like, hey, didn't that guy play Pickett? Instead of, like, casting someone who's, who wasn't in the first movie. Well, then they had, I didn't pay attention enough. Like, I, I really watched the film closely, but there was a picket. Picket was in Gods and Generals, too, yes. played by a different guy. Yeah. Like, I couldn't, I, they didn't show him enough for me to, like, pick out consistently that's the actor playing Picket because I kept being like, Stephen Lang, you were Picket. Why are you Stonewall Jackson? Yeah. He was played by, uh, by Bill, Bill Campbell, Billy Campbell. Billy Campbell. Who was uh, also most notably Cliff Secord in The Rocketeer. Ooh. He was nice also in Gettysburg drop. too. He was a messenger. He shows up for he a was, little bit in there. He was in Gettysburg as a different character as well. Yeah, so that's a bit weird, but Hollywood. What do you guys think Ted Turner's role in all this is? That guy owns a ranch the size of Rhode Island, I heard. <laughs> But he he is the money behind both these films, right? And like I remember seeing Gettysburg on TNT when I was a kid, right? That was where I got exposed to it. And my grandpa got the two VHS box, you know. But that was like a pretty Gettysburg was a pretty big part of my childhood. Like I I probably watched that thing like a dozen times before high school. Just it being on TV and owning it and my grandparents having it. it so. When did you watch it? Because I don't remember watching it as uh, I remember seeing bits and pieces, sort of like Brian said, being on cable. 
but I don't remember actually watching it until I was maybe 19, 18, 19 years old. And I went out and bought the DVD, which if I remember correctly, because the movie is so long, it actually has the movie in two parts on the DVDs, plural. And, uh, but that is the first time that I actually remember sitting through all of Gettysburg. And I'm not even sure if it was a theatrical version or the director's cut. I had the director's cut that I'd watched on Gettysburg when I purchased it before. Uh, I don't know what the differences are. I don't know if I was watching the director's cut before, but um, I remember too, if I'm not mistaken, they showed that on TNT because it was like four hours. They did it like four or five, like it was like a week long affair, right? Like they did like hour <laughs> segments in the evenings or something like that. Like I want to say- well, I mean, it was parts. supposed to be a mini series in the first yeah. place. So I guess they were trying to make it into the mini series it was supposed to be. Do you guys remember sidebar around the same time Patrick Swayze was in a TV show that was oh. a miniseries North and South? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've never seen it, but yeah, I remember it. I had it, got it for Christmas one year on DVD. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't from me, was it? No, no, it was, it was from mom and dad. You know, they okay. knew I was interested in the Civil War and I guess they were like, hey, we remember this TV miniseries from the 70s. Why don't you check it out? Uh, I don't remember if that's the one that's filmed in Van Buren or not. There's one that <laughs> is, though. Yeah. That's interesting trivia. Yeah. I, I didn't think we were going to mention North and South, or I would have <laughs> Googled it and been like, yeah. That was well, I wanted to bring it up because I didn't know if it would be worth us exploring together on a future. <laughs> but rest like, in peace, is it worse? Crazy. Is it worse than Gods and Generals, though? Because... If we're watching that, we might as well watch this. No, uh, Gods and Generals is, as you put it, Julie, the worst war film you've ever seen. And <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. It's it's but, bad. It, what is it? Nor North and North and South. That's the name of the miniseries, right? Well, is it North and South, or was there one called Blue and Gray? Because I, I was thinking heard. Blue and Gray. Yeah, maybe I'm just. There's Blue North and Blue. South, which is like a BBC production not related to the Civil War. So I'm thinking. Let's Google Blue Patrick Blue. Swayze Civil War. See what comes up. North and South. All right. North, North and South. Well, what state. is the? Is there's something called the Blue and the Gray, isn't there? Oh, look at that. Yes, there is. What one is that? Is that Hugh Jackman? Is that a young Hugh Jackman? No way. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. It kind of looks like a man. <laughs> he would never. Um, but I thought it was like from the success of North and South is why they were making Gettysburg as a miniseries in the first place, right? That's why I was thinking that. When you said that, Julie, I was, that's kind of, but I thought about North and South a few times. I remember my mom watching that because, you know, Patrick Swayze's a hunk. I don't know. He's That's great. Why. Everyone he loves Patrick I watch Point. I watch Point Break on vacation, okay? I may That's name my kid movie. Bodie. <laughs> Cora wants to name our first kid Bodie if it's a boy. I'm about, I'm about open to it because I, we can't agree on any other names and, you know. I think you should. Yeah. That's a name that fits in in the South. Oh, yeah. About as much as all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm having a, con uh, well, I, I don't want to call him a controversial figure, but have you guys spotted that page Arkansas Hate Watch on social media? No. The guy that runs it um, is coming on the podcast on Monday. He's like, ba basically his his profile picture is like a, uh, a clan, it's like the Ghostbuster logo, but it's a clan person. And it's got like a circle with an X. <laughs> it's great. But uh, anyway, yeah, so Julie or Thurman, either one, what were you, what was you guys' assessment of our topic here? Like, where did you see the lost cause coming out and gods and generals? Well, should we, should we start with Gettysburg? Because it came well, out. We can. We can. Well, well, it I, is a better movie. I, okay, do, do we want to want to start with analyzing the films and then come back to central points, or do we want to kind of throw some central points out there, talk about the films, and then kind of weave everything back together? You're the dungeon master. 
Oh, I am. I'm the DM. All right. <laughs> All right. Then let's start with some major proponents, sort of the lost cosmos, cause mythology that we see within uh, these two films, Gettysburg, which was released in 1993, and then Gods and Generals, which was released 10 years later in 2003. Now, for me, one of the main issues that we see all throughout the Lost Cause, the Confederacy Lost Cause mythology that rears its ugly head here is this focus on the military history, right? Both of these films are exercises in uh, sort of campaigns, battles, mm -hmm. those sort of things. But it got me to thinking, and I did a little research into it as well. But if you think about it, the focus has, uh, I mean, almost always been, both historians and public have always focused on sort of the confrontations, the battlefield stuff. But that this focus, in a way, distracts a lot from the political and cultural and social norms that existed during the Civil War era. And uh, sort of by focusing on the battlefield, you're taking the attention away from the key issues that caused the war. By focusing on the conflict itself, you're looking at the details, you're looking at the minutia, you're not looking at the larger picture. And in that you lose a lot. So what I was, was sort of thinking is that by turning to the conflict, in a way, you're making it into an incursion that's only between white men for the most part, right? And that by focusing on the battles, it silences and neglects the roles and the influence of millions of black Americans in American history, especially during this time period. And that we're talking about the lost cause. We, the Lost Cause was pretty much invented by ex-Confederate generals. I mean, Jefferson Davis had his hand in it when he wrote his memoirs, but that the UDC was also involved and that they had what was called a uh, measuring rod. I don't know if any of y'all have read about this, which were standards that they would use to sort of indoctrinate the Lost Cause mythology into education, into the teaching of children. And that would be to focus on these major Confederate figures, like generals, like guys like Robert E. Lee, or Thomas Stonewall Jackson, or the great battles of the Civil War, by great battles, the great Confederate battles of the Civil War, as in uh, First Manassas, uh, Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, which we see, right, in Gods and Generals, imagine that. Is that what one of those battles was? <laughs> Well, that's I good, honestly I had no idea what was happening. And I think Antietam was actually in the director's cut, maybe. I don't know why they didn't focus on Jackson's campaign in the Shenandoah Valley in 1862, because that's, that's where Jackson really works his magic, if you want to talk about that. But there wasn't you know, enough opportunities for him to sip lemonade and <laughs> hang out with the little girl. <laughs> that was, that was the that 20 minute monologue with with him and his slave when he's on his horse at night i was just like this slave is really enjoying his life being, well he wasn't you know, a slave he's a he's a freed man yeah, it was, was, it was, so i know one of them got paid wages but was jackson's was that guy was he, his employee well, or what? I didn't in real that. life that's his slave but the movie makes it a point of him saying he's a freed man who has decided to join the confederacy for whatever reason wow the he was a great cook like though i hear <laughs> fed that horsey he really liked that horsey feeding him those well that man. whole scene like i mean Stone stonewall jackson's up on the horse like above this man and them talking to god and then the the um, black dude's like god you know why why, why, why can't these men like wake up and see we're all equal or whatever he says. And then Stonewall Jackson just kind of like, yeah. And that like totally moves on, like doesn't address anything of like, well, sorry, we've mistreated you. <laughs> and then dangles the potential freedom of his brothers, right? In chains. Hey, yeah, you know, we're, we're talking up in Richmond about maybe giving you guys your freedom, you know? And it's like, come on. They weren't talking about this like in 1862, 1863. This didn't happen at that time. 
The only time that this happens is when we're on the downside of the war with the Confederacy. They don't have enough people. They've run out of options. And you've only got maybe a handful of people suggesting it. And when they do, they're given the shaft. It was like I mentioned in the last podcast with General Patrick Claiborne, right? The guy suggests, hey, well, he's, he's an Irishman born, he's born in Ireland, comes over here. So he, he's not really part of the Southern sort of society thing. But maybe that's why he brings it up. But when he does, he doesn't get promoted, right? He was an excellent division commander, but he never goes beyond that. And part of the reason is, is because he suggested, hey, let's uh, possibly give the uh, slaves arms and we'll grant them their freedom if they fight for us. And uh, he dies at the Battle of Franklin in 1864, along with uh, six other brigadier generals in one of the most disastrous frontal charges in the history of the war, actually bigger than Pickett's charge. Wow. Yeah. What was that? What charge was that again? Franklin. Battle Franklin. Franklin. November 1864. Right. Well, something I found really interesting, especially with gods and generals, I don't remember this in Gettysburg as much, is that the movie delivers this idea that uh, the end of slavery was inevitable and was like a year away and that the South, the South was moving towards abolishing slavery like it was this natural thing that was going to happen. And <laughs> for the war was that the North was invading and from Gettysburg, which was Brian's favorite line, states rats. <laughs> rats. <laughs> I like laughed out loud during that scene. <laughs> what are you oh, fighting man. for? My rats. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> well, oh, man. I, I think we can at least say by the onset of the Civil War that the writing is on the wall. Slavery is really on the way out. Now, however, I mean in the North, it's on the way out. In the South, right, they were tooth and nail gonna hold on to the institution for as long as they could, hence why we have the conflict, why this happens. But no, it wasn't like that, it's not like that, uh, like in the, with Ashley Wilkes in the last one, well, I would have set him free anyway. It's not like that. You know, that, that no, no, that wasn't gonna happen. If it's on its way out, then why were they fighting is the question. And I guess these movies would say, the North was invading. We just want it to be left on our own. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. But um, sort of back to what what talking about with sort of the focus on the, the battle thing. It, it's like what, what you said earlier, Julie, you said you felt like Gods and Generals was a film that was made sort of for Civil War buffs or for Civil War reenactors. And sort of when focusing on the battlefront, battlefield, the conflicts, the campaigns, that sort of um, area of the Civil War, which is immensely popular, that's, that's what I thought about. I thought of Civil War reenactors, and I thought of like how passionate they are, how dedicated that they are, like how perfect or precise their uniforms are and their equipment is. And also I started thinking about how most popular Civil War narratives are built around battles, are built around campaigns. It's not necessarily about, oh, such and such at home. It's always, you know, it's, it's the summer of 1863, Pennsylvania, the crossroads of Gate, you know, and, and that's where your story begins. And that's exactly what happens with, uh, uh, with Gettysburg. But uh, that there is this intense focus on battles. And I feel that that clouds or obscures the root of the the problem and i think in a way some of that is intentional well and i think it's a fact too that like when i teach in us one when we get to the civil war i kind of go over the fact that like the union didn't have a lot of fantastic leadership across the board not to say they didn't have good leaders but the the swapping of the generals i they just, uh, other than Hancock in either movie, there's not really a, a prominent Union general character, you know? And, but whereas we get this m major focus, I mean, there's Chamberlain. I love Chamberlain's character, especially oh, yeah. in Gettysburg. Um, I mean, he should have been the main character of the movie, honestly. Yeah. Right. They should have just called it the 20th Main. Yeah. That's <laughs> the only thing I cared about in the movie. The rest of it, you can have. 
Yeah, right. but there, I just felt like there was a, an unfair, and maybe it is the fact that on major battles, the Confederates did well in the first half of the war. Um, but that's uh, there's just like a major focus on the Confederacy and on things that uh, like Lee and Jackson are saying that influence our thoughts and opinions of them. And there are some cases where it's like, you know, Stonewall Jackson's sitting on his horse and he writes a little thing out and he's to take this to General Lee. I, I did a little research on that. And they did, they did do well with interactions like that. It was like, yeah, we had a letter here. We had correspondence there. They did use pri some primary source material, but a lot of those monologues, somebody just made that up. They just made that up and it influences how we view the Confederacy in our time. And I, like, that's one thing I just kept thinking about, particularly on gods and generals, because I felt like there were so many of those monologues that are non-verifiable conversations. Uh, there's one thing I want to go back to here. You mentioned the fact that the uh, Confederacy sort of dominated early in the war. That's not necessarily true, because in the Eastern theater, yes. In the Western theater, the yeah. Union tanned the hides of the Confederacy. Yeah. yeah. Shiloh, Stones River, Perryville, Vicksburg, right? I mean, where are Grand, those? Randy Sherman, man. You know? Oh, Uncle Billy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned Andersonville uh, recently, but that's a quote from that movie. They're like dying in, in the prison camp, and they're like, I hear Uncle Billy's on his way. He's marching through. Yeah. Yeah. Where are but, those movies? Why do why are all of our movies like dedicated to Confederate generals? That's a good point. Growing up, I remember always learning, like in school, that yeah, the Confederate generals were these amazing people, great military strategists, blah blah blah. Watching these movies, I feel like they took it even further in that both Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson are not just great generals, like they are gods in the title. Right. So that, like that, Jesus that. Christ characters. Right. In, 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 in a way, it's almost like, like this, this weird thing that the Southern people are the chosen people. I mean, what? <laughs> Even I, like... It's Stonewall it's, Jackson's de like deathbed was, I mean, so dramatic. I was laughing out loud. I was like, I'm yeah, glad so I saw this in theaters because I would have been kicked out. But yeah, it's so over the top. It's like a saint is dying. Right. He becomes a martyr to the cause, right? The, it, and, yeah. and that's how the movie ends, right? With the flag draped over the casket. And it's like, for, uh, disgusting, y'all. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's propaganda. But no, you know, propaganda. Right, right. It, it is. It's it, it and it's it's weird because it's it's like birth of a nation in a way, propaganda, but it's a different form of propaganda. It's a bit more easier to swallow, I guess. Yeah. Well, definitely. Right, I, right, you know. I I think we're lucky that Gods in General. It, it is such a bad movie that I don't think a lot of people have seen it, <laughs> and I think most people would recognize it as a bad film. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, imagine if Russell Crowe had been in that row. That would have been, it would have been very, very different, I think. I think, and I'm, I'm not knocking Stephen Lang. He's, he's, he's a good actor, don't get me wrong. But Russell Crowe, that's some star power, you know? Well, I would like to hope Russell Crowe would give a more nuanced performance. <laughs> but we'll never really know. Yeah. But, um, Julie, I, I think... Another thing, one thing that I think you really tapped into here, and this is something that I had written out, is the sort of idea about, and I, Brian, you got into it too, but about um, the idea of sort of Confederacy versus Union, the soldiers, the quality of the soldiers. Like, for example, in the Lost Cause narrative, it's like the Union, all they are is commodity and numbers. They have large numbers and they have plenty of supplies, right? The industry, the, the war machine. And then you have the Confederacy, which is all character and quality, right? And that um, there's this weird fallacy, it seems like, that, that the Confederacy had braver and more noble soldiers, right? And that their leaders were, were also superior 
Lee is, yeah, he's practically a god in military history, American military history. He's viewed as this. And, and, and then you have Lost Cause, and you, you have Grant show up later, like in 1864, he takes over. He takes over all the armies, and he starts fighting Lee up in Virginia. And you have, uh, like, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, uh, a Cold Harbor, right? But Grant gets, oh, yeah. labeled, Grant gets labeled a butcher due to the enormous amount of casualties, right? But I think that's a little unfair because Grant, when he's out West fighting, is not having these kind of casualties. It's not until he starts fighting Lee in Virginia do the numbers start going up. And that's because Lee was an aggressive tactician. So Lee is really a butcher, not so much Grant. That's and also the technology had changed. Sorry, guys. I know I'm getting wound up again. Hey, hey the <laughs> audience, look, Thurman, the audience likes it when you go off like this. Okay. They expect it. They comment on it. I get messages about it. Wow. All right? Do us all a favor and keep DMing it. <laughs> but seriously, well, we, I have like, people appreciate your passion. My Siri keeps coming on. Sorry. Well, people should be passionate. This is their history. This is our history. Wait, but Gettysburg and gods and generals is telling me that Lee is this really nice guy. His soldiers love him. He rides around on a horse while everyone's yelling and cheering. How could he be a butcher? See, I'm okay. I will say that, yeah, there are some moments where Lee is absolutely brilliant. And as far as military, it's true. But I think that he's been elevated to this level. It's almost like quasi deity of American military history, and it's just—it's bizarre. I mean, it's—it's it's weird. It, I mean, we have a statue of Robert E. Lee right here in our state. Do we? Does anybody know if Robert E. Lee actually stepped foot in Arkansas? I don't know. I, I know he was at a—he did a parade in I want to say Memphis, Tennessee, right after the war. Or a couple years after the war, he would—he did a tour in major southern cities but i don't know if he came through little rock or anything but i mean he never he never commanded a battle here yet we have a statue for him i mean that's a great great point you know why we, and you had that computer game that was named after him robert e lee civil war general one they made a sequel <laughs> but they, they called it grant they called it lee grant and sherman i think <laughs> civil war general two that's what it means that but um, back to sort of what we were talking about. But the movie, especially, I, I mean, Gettysburg, not so much. I mean, Gettysburg actually shows, right, that there were plenty of brave Union soldiers out there who were willing to, to fight for what they believed was right. Gods and generals, how much? Not so much, right? Uh, I mean, there are scenes, right, where the Union are depicted as just downright cowardly. They're either looting or they're fleeing. <laughs> you know? I also found it really hilarious that like a, a union guy is the only person in gods and generals to use like a racial slur yeah and he, i mean he gets corrected but like no one from the south ever said anything bad and of course you know they treat right. slaves well we get that one slave who's like a housekeeper and she just these are good people i love them that was that whole scene was cringeworthy. Like, Wait, I wrote down the actual quote. Of, I think Julie said it earlier about Stonewall talking to Jim. One way or another, your people <laughs> will be free. <laughs> I laughed out loud. I laughed through the whole movie. But like, yes. Why are we There were a lot of fallacious <laughs> quotes. A lot of fallacious quotes that, like I said, they just, they influence public opinion in a negative way. That's all, that's the best way to, for me right. to state it. <clears throat> but the lost cause myth sort of recasts or, or, or casts Southerners. And I mean, or we'll say Confederates. I, I'm not knocking the whole South. I just want to make that clear. We have to have a distinction between, when I say South, I'm referring to the Confederate States of America. But that the idea is that the Confederate is this individualist, that they're this anti-modernist, that they're this real American like uh, archetype of patriotism and liberty, and that they're holding on to these old ideas. And apparently the Union really has no ideas to begin with. But that uh, 
the Southerners, or as in the Confederates, are depicted as a wholesome and almost, I'd say, divine people. In, in especially gods and generals, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they quote the Bible a whole lot. Like I said, sip and lemonade on the porch all the time. Mm. Um, and are, are very so like patriotic. I mean, this is gods and generals is states rights the movie because everything is about like, I love, I love Virginia. I love my state. I would die for her. And I, I don't know. I'm just like, this is so over the top. I guess probably back then. Well, I know people now have a lot of, of uh, pride in their states, but I'm like, this is a lot. Were they, well, were they that into it? Or <laughs> like, is this a, a dramatization? Like how much were they that loyal to their states? Well, um, like something, something that, that was really, really interesting or fascinating to me was sort of the juxtaposition of how you have in Gettysburg the Union cause versus the Confederate cause, which the Union cause is summed up by Chamberlain by that fantastic speech at the beginning of the movie. Like, I love that speech. I'll admit it. Like when he says, you know, uh, uh, what we're fighting for, you know, in the end, we're fighting for each other, you know, that sort of thing. And it's like, hey, that, you know, that's that's the cause I can get behind. You're fighting for somebody's freedom, right? You're fighting to free free slaves and free everybody, pretty much on the American continent. But then it's like you get to the end of the movie with Pickett's Charge, right? Where you have Louis Armistead, who's who's talking to the uh, I forgot what the British guy's name was, what they called him, right? And they're waiting to get to and he's like, you see that guy over there? That's George Washington's great grandson, you know. He's fighting for Virginia, you know? And it's like, oh, come on, y'all. <laughs> it's just so, it's so cheesy is what I mean, you know? Chamberlain's cause seems more relatable. I mean, that's something I can relate to today. I'd be like, yeah, I'd go out there and fight for somebody's, you know, for people to be free, because that's an American ideal. But this, it just seems, it's so corny. It's so cornball. It's ridiculous. Are you talking about Chamberlain's yeah. speech from Gettysburg or his yeah. speech from Gods in General? Okay. No, no, from Gettysburg, from the beginning of Gettysburg, right. Yeah, I, so I, I actually, this was the first time I ever watched the full Gettysburg movie, but I had seen that scene in two different leadership classes. Ooh. I mean, it, it's great. Like, it's powerful. He shows great leadership. Yeah, uh, stating what they're fighting for and making it a communal cause yeah it's great and his he has a speech in gods and generals that's more hits you over the head about slavery and freedom it's definitely not as good but but i mean yeah and, and then they have him like quoting like roman history stuff and it's like when the hell did that happen teacher of rhetoric right well i mean it's like in Gettysburg, I feel like, and I mean, okay, was uh, God's in general supposed to be earlier or whatever, even though, right, he, he does look like he's 10, 15 years older, obviously. A little, little heavier, too. Yeah. Know, little... Not judging. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, that um, the Chamberlain, to me, in Gettysburg, he's, he's um, I describe him as stoic, but he's passionate. You know, I mean, obviously, he's, he's an academic, but he's not that academic. It's not like he is in Guys and Generals. He just sounds like a walking textbook. I think they tried to play on, in Guys and Generals, a lot of the things that the audience from Gettysburg liked or appreciated. Or <clears throat> I just saw, like, in, in both movies, in a way, a lot of packing in of, like, how many of the narratives that people know of that are common in – the hearts and minds of American citizens can we hit on the head in one movie, right? Like, I mean, it re really seems like they are trying to do that, like from both sides, less so from the Union side, and less egregiously, I think, in Gettysburg. Like Thurman and I have talked about that. Like, I have less of a problem with Gettysburg, but there's still some issues there. Um, but I feel like Gettysburg is a, a lot more balanced in its treatment, which I guess, you know, you kind of have to be since it's about a major battle that the South lost. 
well, whereas you know I also feel like I mean Gettysburg is a lot more about yeah the generals and in the battles or the battle um whereas gods and generals really tries to get into the philosophy behind <clears throat> the war was happening but obviously doesn't really believe it's about slavery and thinks it's more about northern aggression but also wants to include black people in the narrative but in doing so and not saying that it's slavery it reduces them to i mean they they look like idiots supporting the confederacy it's horrible or it, it like goes beyond the mammy stereotype of this woman who's so attached to her white family that owns her. It's just, it's ludicrous, laugh out loud, like almost birth of a nation bad. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. And yeah. the director's cut that adds like another black character, that's the one that's like, you know, my my owner, he, he gave, gave me my freedom papers. papers. <laughs> now I work for, he's my boss. I'm like, oh my God. And then they're like, yeah, shaking hands and like, we're with the Confederacy. I'm like this, oh my, I got to watch Glory after this. This is not what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Glory, you know, we've talked about hitting on Glory in the past. Is that something you guys want to do? I, I thought maybe if, if we did, what I was thinking about next episodes, I mean, I know we're going to do Kim Burns' Civil War at some point as kind of a whole, I mean, over several of these episodes, but uh, maybe we would do Glory and uh, 12 Years a Slave. Hmm. Those are yeah. pretty good together. And, and then maybe uh, sort of uh, maybe Django Unchained and the outlaw Josie Wales. Ooh. So, you know, kind of, kind of similar. Like you're, you're pairing food and wine here. <laughs> yes, great pairings, great pairings. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, uh, I also th was thinking Twelve Years a Slave because I was watching Gods and Generals. I was like, this is like discrediting the Black American experience in the Civil War. Like, this is not okay. Yeah. No. No. Can com com completely, completely agree with that. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I'm surprised that a movie like that could have been made sort of in the last 20 years. You I know? was wondering, yeah, the why it was made. I don't feel like there was a ton of demand. I mean, it was a box office bomb. Right. Um, so the, obviously there wasn't really the audience for it that they thought there would be. But 10 years, or yeah, 10 years after Gettysburg, they want to make a prequel. I the, like the whole thing was just a bad idea from the beginning. Have you guys had uh, ever read any of the books that these movies are based off of? No, I never read the Killer Angels. That was uh, that was Michael Michael Shera uh, uh, Michael Shera, right? And Jeff, his son, wrote the uh, Gods and Generals. Okay. But, uh, uh, the Killer Angels, the book that Gettysburg is based on. Uh, I believe won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1975 because I think the book was published in 74, but it was in 75. So it was, you know, I mean, it was a big deal. The book was a big deal. And you know, once again, we have another Civil War film based on a book. We actually have two more based on books. And uh, I mean, Gettysburg, yeah, enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good flick. Uh, Gods and Generals is a disaster, and uh, Sa and same director. Am I am I correct in that they had the yeah. same director? Yeah, why, was, I mean uh, that's so. Why do you think uh, they uh, took uh, the turn like that? Like Gods and Generals, I think is different than Gettysburg. I think Gettysburg's got some lost cause mythology in it. Like we could we could hit on the points, but it's like a reversal on Gods and Generals. It's like we're going this other direction with this film, but it's the same director. It's a lot of the same cast members. It's just it's an interesting dichotomy, really, because, like, I watched Gettysburg after Gods and Generals. That's the order I watched them, because I watched Gettysburg last semester. But I just kept thinking that. I'm like, man, these movies are really different. Like, there's no there's no continuity, but we got some character similar. It was just, it was head-scratching. Well, also, like, Gods and Generals has pretty much no plot narrative. It 
follows kind of what happens in history with the battles and then we're left with Stonewall Jackson to be the main character because there's nobody else that really has any sort of character arc which he doesn't either the whole movie is a mess there's like like saying what the plot is is just like well it's some civil war battles Right, they kind of turn the uh, Eastern, early Eastern theater of the Civil War into kind of like a Universal Studios tour. Hey, if you look over <laughs> here, you'll see the uh, Battle of Fredericksburg, Mary's Heights, you know, and it's like, come on. There's nothing in depth about it. It's just you're kind of there. And, and, and uh, Julie, it's like you mentioned, you have no idea what's going on. The, the battles like, have no sense. Battle there's, no, there's no sense of geography. Right, I mean, Gettysburg, you at least have kind of an idea. It's like Chamberlain, 20th Maine. Hey, you guys hold a little round top. If you don't, they're going to flank us and the whole Union, uh, uh, the whole Union left is going to collapse. You know, that sort of thing. Okay, that makes sense, right? This, it's, I have no idea what's happening. And the only way, or if I was an untrained observer, I'd have no way of happening. I mean, I've read about these battles, so I kind of have some idea, but even then I'm still lost. Okay. We got some Confederates, they're charging out of some trees. That is a great point. It's, it, they address, um, Gettysburg is a three day ordeal. You know, they address each individual day. First day is really shortly addressed in the first part of the film and that's all like day two and day three. But man, and two, battle a little round top cinematically. Like even this time rewatching it, I was like, Kind of like, like getting goosebumps and like tearing up a little bit, like when they start charging down the hill and man, that's a awesome fighting montage. I was, I was digging it. Well, and I, I think that that's, that's necessary because in a way, I, as I said earlier, the common Confederate lost cause myth is that Union soldiers did not have the kind of salt or drive that that are, or they, the Union soldiers did not have, have the kind of uh, sort of uh, stamina or power or whatever uh, that, 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 that the Union didn't have that like the Confederacy had. And, and that's, that's a perfect example of, you know, that, that there were brave soldiers, right, on the Union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that like when ev when everybody in the audience saw what I the scene I just described, it, it I wonder if if God I know it's based off a book, but if God's in generals didn't become this like hey, look we can make some money even though I think that they lost money in the end off, get, that we got to get them another run with this character, you know we got to get Jeff Daniel back in here and show and just like did us a disservice because like. I really was like hating his character and gods and generals. Whereas I loved his character in Gettysburg. Like he's one of the most memorable characters of, of movies watching when I was a kid. So I was just like, man, this is, is that feel short changed on. Like, how, how, I wish he'd been nominated for an Academy Award for Gettysburg. I thought he was great in it. Yeah. There's that part, there's that part at, 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 toward the end of the movie where they find out that Sergeant Kilrain died. And he's just like completely like shell shocked, but he's like fighting back tears. So good because you see that stoicism, that sort of nineteenth century stoicism, but you know he's still deeply affected. Yeah, like, yeah, that takes a good actor to do that. You know. Well, to that actor that played the sergeant that dies, he turned down. Julie, you're gonna hate this. He turned down a part in Lord of the Rings so he could be in, God, <laughs> so he could be in Gods and Generals. Yeah, I like how we did the same thing there. <laughs> oh, wow. I hope you You're got one of the only things, I, other than the basic plot, Julie is one of the only things I remember about the first Lord of the Rings because I think you were there like both times I saw it. Right? I, was, I think there every time they showed it. <laughs> they knew me at the theater. <laughs> That's great. But yeah, I couldn't believe that. He was like, yeah, I'm going to reprise my role in Gods and Generals and not be in Lord of the Rings. And I was just like, oh, man. That's a really poor career decision. Yeah. Yeah. But um, sort of back to main lost cause points. And this, this might be actually inadvertent. This may just be an American thing. I don't know. But the romanticization of war. 
is prevalent in both of these these films. And in a way, it's almost like a bloodless depiction of violence at times. Uh, the Civil War was horrible. I mean, awful. Like, if you read the firsthand accounts, I mean, you see the Matthew Brady photographs, the dead at Antietam, right? Just how how savage this war really was. But here, it's like, in a way, they almost resemble more sort of the paintings that you see of the Civil yeah. War. Instead of the, say, the, the yeah, the, the, the pictures from the battlefront of the dead strewn across the battlefields, just mangled. And uh, the, it's yeah, not they, like this. Do we that? see blood at any time? Like, I don't remember seeing a lot of blood in either film. Well, there was that one hilarious scene, I, I say hilarious, in, <laughs> um, in, in Gods and Generals, they're at Antietam in the cornfield, and a guy's canteen gets shot. Oh, there's some water. You know, that's it. Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, and uh, like I have been to a reenactment before. It was hilariously at Huntington Beach, California, where I don't think they had any battles, but they put on a reenactment. And it's it was interesting to see, yeah, kind of how the warfare actually worked and how they got so close to each other. And to think, yeah, going from shooting and then having to reload and it's like the slowest reload ever then to bayonets like it's it's a pretty brutal style of warfare and i don't really think either film really portrays that maybe gettysburg a little bit but gods and generals i i couldn't tell you what was happening in the battles it was just a lot of stuntmen doing flips when a cannon would land near them that was it yeah, but they yeah. got a lot of critiques for visibly. Like I thought, I, I mean, just the scale of gods and generals on the costuming and the production. I thought the sets on a lot of them, like um, there's one scene towards the end where the um, Union is marching past a river. I can't remember which one, but like the whole set looks fake. And then the rubber, uh, rubber rifles with the rubber bayonets, like that's something. I flipped through the the IMDB had some trivia on gods and generals. I don't think they um, had so on the Gettysburg, but that was one thing like a lot of civil war enthusiasts were very critical of on gods and generals. I didn't see that as much on the Gettysburg, but I couldn't find like as much trivia. Uh, Cause I like that. Like uh, sometimes Amazon and HBO, different movies will have like a trivia section. You can just flip through it on the app on your phone and it's actually pretty informative, but gods and generals had, like a couple of dozen goofs they're like messed up here messed up here messed up here like it was just goof 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 so yeah. i mean yeah. they had 10 years between films to like really get this right i don't know if it was just like a month before a few months before they started they're like oh i guess we'll make this prequel but yeah it's like there was really no thought into any of it and I mean, it was also backed by Ted Turner, right? So it's not like they didn't have money to make it. Fun fact, Ted Turner is in the film. As who? Where, where, yeah, as who? He's, 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 in, he's in Gettysburg uh, at the end. He's in Pickett's Charge. He's an officer who gets shot. <laughs> no, for real. Actually, the character he's playing is uh, General George S. Patton's like grandfather or something like that, who got mortally wounded. At, at, was a confederate all yeah, the great the blood movie. fought for the confederacy it appears george washington we got Patton. Like <laughs> lee lee was number two in his class at west point let's not forget that okay right oh wow but yeah um so but yeah the, i mean it's sort of like a sanitized version of the civil war now i know julie you just recently watched glory and the battle sequences in that i think are really well done yeah, they I haven't are. seen Glory in a long time. There, ahead, one, one thing I complained to Thurman about with Gettysburg was the charges, they're walking. <laughs> like they'll yell charge and then just start kind of plodding across the field. And Glory, when they yell charge, like they're a full run. So you yeah, watching Gettysburg, I was like, God, like I move through the mall faster than these guys. Why are they moving so slow? 
Um, and Glory also like does a lot. That's another thing I remember from the reenactment was like the smoke, like the from the guns and stuff. Like it feel like the field, like it got really foggy from all the smoke. Glory does that. I don't really remember that from either Gettysburg or Gods and Generals. Yeah. I have to rewatch Gods and Generals two days later because I couldn't remember anything. <laughs> all I remember oh, was fish. lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> oh man it was you know i did I, there's a couple of times where i was like rap like I, I watched it in like three sittings so there's a couple of times where i rewound like where i started to kind of like it, it wasn't retention was not there for me either and i got i watched what did you guys think about the because did both of y'all watch the director's cut on gods and generals uh what do you think about that john wilkes booth side plot why what was the point i think i think i know i think okay. it was to tie in i think they were trying to do it for continuity so i think that was more of a strategy there here than history ever was do you know the actor that rides into long street's camp that is the actor acting alongside john wilkes booth that, that's that's the only reason they had an entire subplot was because one guy shows up in the other one. But when I watched Gettysburg, I was like, oh, it makes sense now. This guy. I see what they did there. I, I thought potentially they were leaving it open for a sequel so that apparently Ron Maxwell can fulfill his further confederate delusion and have lincoln assassinated you know hey yeah we can well didn't it say something at the end about it being a, a trilogy or did i make that there's up? a third book there is a third book called yeah. like one final measure or last final measure something like that i feel like at the end of the theatrical there's something about the trilogy and i was like well that's not gonna happen not in our lifetime. Unless they want to do 20 years after Gods and Generals and bring back the same people. You have Daniels in a wheelchair. That oh, scene man. where Stonewall Jackson's like, I'm 38. I laughed out loud. I was like, you are in your 50s, sir. <laughs> it's a hard life, Julie. He's still alive. <laughs> They'll bring him back and cast him as someone else. Yeah, you know, um, a couple of the... I don't know, like, too, I didn't feel like they, the things I even read about Jackson, I felt like they, like his, how eccentric he was. Mm -hmm. I wish they would have played on that. Like, let him, like, show me how he rode his horse. Thing. Right? He's got Ride himself, right? right? Balance himself or whatever. Yeah. Apparently ate lemons all the time, hence probably the lemonade on the porch. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he was weird. He was allegedly weird. I don't remember, I don't know if him or another Confederate general allegedly ate bird seed all the time or something like that. Yeah, it was weird. These aren't normal people, y'all. <laughs> you know, too, I've been I, uh, looking into this a little bit, like uh, how unfortunate, like so people getting treatment then and even now dying of pneumonia while their wounds are actually probably not that bad because of the drugs that were given them. Right, like they're like, here, have some more morphine so you can die of pneumonia. His wounds are healing. Like I'm like, don't give him the morphine. What are you doing? Like, but um, I will say, like I had a hernia repair six years ago, and they put me on like three different meds, like an antibiotic and like a pain pill, and then like something for the pain pill, like if it created any side effects. But I was just laid up and I could not walk hardly because I had 12 staples in my groin, couldn't stand up straight, minimal movement. I was breathing so shallow, my chest like filled up with fluid, right? And I didn't even have my arm cut off or anything. Or, and I wasn't taking morphine, I was just taking hydrocodone. But like, lacking back and then like thinking about that, I'm like, man, like, and pneumonia is such a leading cause of death for people. Uh, in hospitals or that just like a lot of people get it from traveling right like they'll go out on like uh, com like Bob Saget said he went on a comedy tour and got pneumonia and I was like wow that's interesting but I, I think that that was like uh, I I've read about that it's like that he was kind of expected to recover and then died of pneumonia is that is that what you guys picked up from yep. other sources yeah yeah yeah, yeah that right that's after a, being oh. shot by his own men in the dark is this a comedy like what's happening 
Well, see, and remember when they dropped him? Like they show that. That was a goof too. There was no um, fire raining down or anything. Remember there's like, and they drop him, but they actually did drop him and they <laughs> cite that as a cause, they think the cause of death, like, well, they, they handled him a little roughly when they're getting him out of there after our own guys shot him. But uh, that was something that I've seen come up is like, well, they were a little rough when they were leaving the battlefield, maybe broke a rib or something. It's like, no, you're probably just chucking him full of pain meds and he's not breathing deep enough. <laughs> I mean, that was yeah. my assessment. Was it, is it true? Isn't the hypodermic needle was invented in, during the Civil War? Is that true? I think um, so. I, I remember watching this like PBS miniseries and that was, it was in the Civil War. That was a, a part of it. And a doctor was like, this will save many lives. It was really over the top. But yeah, it was a hypodermic needle. So it was it on acting level of gods and generals? It was better. Anything is better than guns and generals. I mean, some of them are good actors. They're just, I don't know if it was bad directing or the script was just awful, but the acting was really bad. Which brings us to our next question. Who's the better lead? Martin Sheen or... Definitely uh, Martin Sheen. Robert Duvall. That's right. The guy who you said first, not the guy who you couldn't remember because it was that unmemorable of a performance. But I think Robert Duvall looks and like... I will give you that, big time. Like Robert E. Lee. But he doesn't have a lot to do except be like, I love Virginia. Yeah, I mean... Whole part. I, I think that uh, Robert Duvall, you know, would have done fine if they had cast him as an oak tree. <laughs> you know, I, I think I think I'm not not Robert Duvall is a great actor but definitely he is like, it's a, it, he didn't do what he was capable of in that film that's what I was I was when I text you that Thurm out because I text you who you thought the better lead was right as I was like getting to know his character but they really don't even I don't it's way more of a Stonewall Jackson party I feel like they don't pay him enough service in that film I felt like they were maybe trying to do a dichotomy of gods and generals is more about Stonewall Jackson, Gettysburg's more about Lee. But I definitely Sheen did a way better performance. He made me, he made me like the kindly General Lee a little more. Well, kindly but also fiery too, right? He's more dimensional. He has more sides. There yeah. is no time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like how Longstreet's like, hey, we probably shouldn't do that. We're going to get our asses kicked. And he's like, you will do it, sir. You will yeah. send your men and we will do that. I don't care what you say. I know. Like, it's just like, oh, my gosh, man. But, I, you know, Behringer in Gettysburg uh, playing Longstreet, excellent performance, I thought. I, I remember when I was a kid, I really liked his character, too, and I didn't know who Tom Behringer was from The Substitute at that time. Right. It was a later 90s experience of my childhood. <laughs> he didn't come back for gods and generals, right? No, no. Okay. Yeah. The annuity on that film is just straight up awful. <laughs> I know. Well, apparently, um, I don't know. I felt like their treatment of Longstreet and those interactions with Lee, because he does question him quite a bit in the film, lines up with at least how long street is in accounts i've read post civil war because he's pretty pissed off after gettysburg right what's interesting especially in early lost cause mythology is that many of the confederate gen or several of the confederate generals who were architects of the lost cause guys like jubal early tried to paint long street out as being the guy who cost the confederacy the battle of gettysburg <laughs> Not Lee's, you know, ordering this this ill-fated, ridiculous, twelve thousand man charge frontal assault. It's not going to go anywhere. But that Longstreet had held up an attack or something, and and if he had pressed forward, they would have won the battle. But they tried to make him out to be sort of the villain of Gettysburg, and part of the reason was is because Longstreet later became a Republican. Traitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man. Are you sure it, it wasn't? You know, is it? It's not because he charged too slowly. <laughs> I know it's so ridiculous, right? Yeah, it just 
I, I've actually never thought about that, but then that has to, I think, do something with the romanticism of it, right? Having them just, I mean, they just, I can't even say they briskly walk. They kind of just stroll through a field. And trot. Yeah. No, I'm like, we have. Ask for this. This is plodding across the field. It's like if someone is shooting at you, you're walking towards them. You're supposed to be running. Like you would be running. Right. There's another scene in that movie where there's, uh, I think it takes place at a place called Devil's Den in, in Gettysburg. There are these large boulders, rocks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the Confederates actually ran the Union out of there, but they have a scene of that in there. And there's a bunch of like Union guys and they're kind of climbing down the rocks as they're being shot at. I'm like, no, they'd be throwing themselves down those rocks. I'd rather have a broken ankle, ankle than lose my life, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you know, a very similar thing happened. We crossed the Niagara border in the war of 1812 and, and fought on a hill and did get pushed off a hill and people were jumping over a cliff into a river and down boulders and stuff and dying, fleeing for their lives because they were get, they got attacked by, I want to say it was a, the Grand River Iroquois warriors that were fighting for the British across the, across the border there in Canada. But I remember hearing about that, but yeah, that is, a, that's like, that's a great historical example of like when you're fleeing and you're on the side of the hill, you're going to jump off. Like there's right. nowhere else to go. You're not going to stand there and get shot or captured. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh. So um, a question sort of ties in with, with the yeah, more lost cause mythology. Why the focus on Gettysburg? Why is Gettysburg so important? Any of y'all consider think about that? I mean, is Gettysburg really the turning point of the war? Is it, is it, Certainly what, not what, what is the attraction is what I'm saying? What is the allure of Gettysburg? What is it that makes it so important to the lost cause mythology? Cause I mean, you got guys like, like William Faulkner writing about it and uh, it's, it's this, everything is about Pickett's charge. It seems like. Yeah. Yeah. What is your assessment of that? Um, I think what, well, what's interesting is to think about what was the Confederacy, the army attempting to do. And one of the things that they were trying to do was win legitimacy with the Europeans, like uh, with England, uh, sort of like we did with the Revolutionary War, how we got France mm -hmm. involved, and that, you know, if the Confederacy had so many victories and could prove that they could really uh, strike in the North that, that they, they would win. Uh, but I, mean, I don't know if the war was exactly lost at that point, but out West, it, it was. Out West, the war was lost for the Confederacy, in, in my opinion. But I don't know why there is this, this, fascina this huge fascination with Gettysburg. When, like I mentioned, in November 1864 at the Battle of Franklin, you have an even larger Confederate charge that costs more men than, than Pickett's charge. You have Grant at Cold Harbor who loses, uh, I don't remember if it was like five, 10,000 men in the span of like 20 minutes in a full-on frontal charge. But why are we so fixated on on Pickett's charge, George Pickett. Why? What? What is? What is the point? Who was so ridiculous in the movie? Yeah, and it doesn't really go along with the narrative, I guess, of what, like, of the Lost Cause mythology, right? Or, I mean, in what well, way is it connected? Is that? I've always been taught like Gettysburg is where like the North proved that they could win, and that it was like the turning point. Like the South had been so certain that they were going to win this war. It was like an easy victory. And Gettysburg is the turning point where they lose. And then it's all downhill from there. I maybe also have something to do with the name being more memorable than things like, you know, First Manassas or whatever. Antietam, but, like, I don't know. But I think that's a little unfair, though. I think it's a little unfair to say that because if, if, there's sort of this this idea that well the south were assured victory they were going to win but you know the north proved them wrong and it's like it almost makes it sound like a fluke 
Yeah. I don't I think, think it was point. a fluke. No, but I don't think it was. I don't. I well, think that's. Have... I, I think that's the point of lo like lost cause mythology is to say yeah. that fluke, and then it's all like bad luck for the South after, which you know is like saying that the South just it wasn't their day. Not saying like well, they were the you know inferior military force. Right. Right. But it's, it's yeah, it's, it's like, um, but yeah, that, that it's almost like this idea that, 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 yeah, they just kind of happened into victory. And I don't, I don't think, it, I, I think you had determination. And I think that shows in the movie you have that in Gettysburg, right? You got guys like Chamberlain, you got Sam Elliott, John, John Buford, right? The Calvary commander. Right. I mean, these are, and, and uh, you got Hancock in there. I mean, these are guys who are, they, they want to win, right? They, they have reasons to fight. And when you have Pickett's Charge and you got like the Union guys and they're just beating the hell out of the Confederates, and what are they chanting? Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg, right? Because that's where, where they got whipped. So it's kind of like a vengeance type thing at this point. And um, kind of to go back to what we were talking about, the fascinating, is this the turning point of the war? I think you can even argue that the turning point of the war, because I mean, remember Vicksburg also falls at the same time that Gettysburg happens. But you could say that really the war is over whenever Sherman takes Atlanta. Mm -hmm. That that's like the true sort of, that's it folks, good night. Because he yeah, set all the supply lines, divides the South in half, and there's, there's no way they can recover from that. Well, you're back to like, what does lost cause mythology want us to believe? They want us to believe that the South is these, the Confederate soldiers are these gentlemen and they're the superior generals. And yeah, that it was like a bad turn of luck and not like you got totally crushed by Sherman and we're all crap in your pants while he's <laughs> running through your towns. Like they don't want to talk about that. They want to talk about Gettysburg, which in the movie too is presented as this very like kind of gentleman's like war and yeah that they made a few bad calls and it just led to their downfall not that you know from the beginning like the union had more resources um and were you know poised to win the war eventually well, why the this is why, why do we call it picket's charge why not lee's charge because they don't want Lee to have like association with such a failure. Well, Thurman, like what is the points you're making kind of got me thinking this, like, and you bring this up with Ken Burns' Civil War, right? And we see like, so maybe what if rogue sympathizing historians that aren't necessarily a part of sons of the confederacy or daughters of the confederacy or the dar or, or something like that i mean i've heard dr de black talk about one of these people being in arkansas that like thinks the south is going to rise again type of situation right so it's like you know have some of those historians existing who were geographically located in the south maybe that were sympathizing with elements and components of lost cause myth and interjecting into the scholarship could that have tilted like some of these questions we're asking like well, where does this make sense like this is really what's going on much bigger picture where you know when that history was written was it influenced in that in, in a way by some of these people and just like strands and threads enough to like tilt the narrative one way or get us like looking too much at like a certain event within a within an event. I don't know if that makes sense, but awkward oh, we, pause. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> no it's, it's all good. It's all good. Just kind of thinking about it, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, I hope that doesn't go on, but man, you pointing that out, like I hadn't really paid much attention to that being as prevalent as it is in Ken Burns' Civil War, and now I'm like, what the fuck, man? Like. It's, <laughs> So it's like, well, if, if, if Ken Burns is letting this in, is this hat, where else is it happening? You know, and, and it, and when did it happen? It's like, uh, from the point, it's like we had eight former Confederate officers that were governor of Arkansas after reconstruction, like 
we always talk about them and the people who, who became politicians, but like, what about people who became historians? Like that were like, you know, yes, we know that there was uh, there were school textbooks rewritten, but it's like these groups may have funded and stuff, but I don't feel like, you know, historians write history at the end of it. It's like the ladies at the, at the UDC didn't write it. So maybe they did. I don't know. I got to dig deeper on that, but it's something I, that I've thought about because of that point you've made on the Ken Burns documentary. Right. Yeah. Well, I feel like the ahead, South or Confederacy was such sore losers that they didn't want to admit they lost a war. So they've spent, I mean, we're up to 150 years kind of spinning these different, like basically historical tales instead of just saying, yeah, we lost a battle, not just lost Gettysburg. We lost several battles after this. Because, yeah, you never really see anything after. It just goes straight into Reconstruction and the North being carpetbaggers and scallywags. Yeah. Um, I think what we should do is probably get together and write a series of essays and entitle it The Long Confederacy <laughs> about how... Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, because, I mean, think about it, y'all. The Union may have won the physical war, but the cultural war, part, yeah. We're, we're still fighting it. It's still happening. It's still going on today. And unfortunately, as we've seen with, as we see some of the materials in here and some of the more egregious things that we, we've watched like Birth of a Nation, it's the, they're winning. It's a hearts and minds battle. Yeah. You know, it's, um, you know, and that's why I, I, I tell people now like with some you know I, i've got my blog for the podcast if you ever want to if you ever want to run off and write an essay i'll be knowing how to post to the blog i'm getting trained on it on monday i've never been able to post post to the blog on my website i always have to feed it to the web guy i'm actually going to be able to do it on on the podcast and on the gym site now but that's why i'm starting the blog too is because like these longer social media posts i'm going to start putting on the blog you know, and I think it'll be a great like spin off on some of these topics that we're, we're uh, introducing into the podcast. But yeah. Right. But like, I would say culturally, that uh, the lost cause has such a foothold in what we consider or what most people consider American history that it's so hard to root out, even if you have factual evidence or empirical evidence that shows otherwise to the point. It's like uh, you bring up the secession letters, Brian, you, you've mentioned that before, right? I mean, it mentions, it says distinctly in there why they're leaving. 80 times. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm not, right. There's slavery mentioned 80 total times, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's the stat. But that the Confederacy was founded on the ideal of preserving slavery for the planter class. And uh... the fact that we are like having to, you know, write to government officials to remove the Confederate flag from like public Dixie Outfitters. From where? You... Okay, so the big controversial thing now is Dixie Outfitters. Have you guys <laughs> been following this at all? Okay, it's this place that sells like all Confederate shit. And they have like all the state flags with the Confederate symbolism, like flying on top of their, and they have stores in um, Branson and Springfield. Imagine that. Of course. Yeah. But that's this guy from Arkansas Hate Watch. He's all over that. And these peripheral communities to Harrison, there's a bunch of crazy shit going on in. Zinc. I, I, he's going to talk about it on the show, but I was telling him, I'm like, Hey, what do you know about Dardnell? <laughs> you know, like let's talk <laughs> about that. Cause he is like, He's chimed in on some of the stuff here with like when I went to that George Floyd protest, uh, like right after he got killed, there was a, a bigger protest, that first one in Russellville. And there was a bunch of 50 year old white dudes who post xenophobic shit on their Facebooks all the time and saying they're not racist down there carrying ARs around, intimidating people. And it's like, oh, man, it's it, it, so this is drawn this this type of people here too of like yeah okay well there's nazi rallies in russellville and there's 
counter people showing up that are calling themselves the Pope County Militia now. Oh my God. To counter these protests that are protesting for racial equality, right? And I think we very much got boiled up in um, like the narrative of, yeah, we got some white supremacists over here saying that Antifa is about to get bust in, is going to raid and loot the Park Valley Center where JCPenney and stuff is. And it's like, you guys probably, you, your guys' group, wherever you're out of, wherever your white supremacy group is from, is probably who started that. Like, because they would never give up their sources. They're like, we're working with our, we're working for RPD. We're working alongside them. And RPD, like, I got a bunch of people that I talked with uh, from that part of uh, that sector. And uh, like, the chief of campus police was keeping me posted. And he's like, no, we, RPD has no association with those people and they actually do not like them being out there because uh, everybody is scared. Like I felt scared. Like I felt nervous. Like I was talking to somebody about like having minor paranoia about the coronavirus and anxieties and stuff. And I compared it like, it's like when I've, when I was walking over around that protest and somebody was like, uh, Hey, they're coming around the corner with guns. And it's like, <laughs> And, and but, but why I'm making all these points is like, this is born out of this stuff that we are lamenting about, right? Of this mythology and, and how many hearts and minds it won, right? That's the, the most disturbing part for me and the, the quest for social justice will have to continue because of it. And then the whole like, and this is part of the long con of the Confederacy is like the, the Confederate flag and the whole like, this is my heritage. This is heritage, not hate. And I'm like, you know, our family were, some of them were loyalists during the American Revolution. Do you see me like running around with flying a Union Jack out off my front porch? And like, I'm not proud of that. I don't know why they did that, but I'm not going to be like, that's my heritage. So I will blindly stand by what they did. Absolutely not. And people need to wake up to like what the Confederacy stood for and if why your family did this. I don't know. I don't care. But why are you doing this now? That's what I want to know. The one comment you made, Thurman, um, on the last podcast, I got a couple of comments is uh, like you went on, you went on um, to explain that like history is not a statue. History is in books. Right, but that's like a, two two different people were like, yeah, that guy was like, like debunked the whole history is the statue thing, you know. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's not. I was like, and, and to be real, like Thurman and and me and Julie could go pull the statue over. It was so fastly and cheaply put together. You know what I'm saying? They're like made out. They're super lightweight. Like uh, I was uh, looking into like how they were made and stuff. And they're like made out of a lightweight, like aluminum alloy or something. That's we could definitely yeah, I've heard people out. be like, it's art. Like an artist made this. I'm like, it's out of a catalog. You know, what's crazy is like, I'm afraid now with stuff that's gone on in some States. Did you see those 87 protesters? Um, at that governor's residence that got convicted of felonies, like that's voter yeah. suppression right like there was another protest going on about like not wearing a mask or something and they like had to put a fence around the dude's uh house and they didn't arrest a person they were like super orderly that day the 87 people got charged with a felony like they were like sitting in organized air patterns and stuff like nothing as egregious as what had occurred like two weeks earlier but uh yeah that's it's unfortunate well, going back to the to the statues, I mean, uh, our viewpoint on it, I mean, uh, even though I don't necessarily want to tear them down, destroy them, I think they belong in a museum or in a cemetery. You, re you sounded very much like uh, Dr. Jones there. <laughs> <laughs> this belongs oh, in a museum. Museum, yeah. <laughs> so do you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, uh, that... Um, that we're, we're kind of viewed as enemies of the state now. Even though we don't want, we don't want them destroyed. We just want them moved out of public places. We're still considered enemies of, I mean, the commander in chief himself, President Donald Trump, right? We 
You got to defend the statues. It's the Confederacy, man. Yeah. That's you, want, you know, like, too, if Trump wouldn't have started talking about George Washington, like that's like, I don't know what we talked about at the beginning, because like George Washington had a Klan outfit put on him that day. We had the podcast last and they had ter- torn down like a, a Thomas Jefferson statue, Missouri. All of these statues are getting hit. The Abraham Lincoln with the slave statue, the Teddy Roosevelt statue. But none of that outcry. Well, the Teddy Roosevelt one, I'd heard them make comments on before, honestly. But um, before Trump said stuff about it, I felt like those statues weren't in danger. I don't know. Like maybe the Thomas Jefferson was because of uh, Sally Hemings, and that's more widespread and admitted by the Jefferson Foundation now. But anyway. <clears throat> Guys, I actually got to go pick up some dinner at this present time. Nice. Pasta grill. Yeah, we're hey, we're gonna watch Hamilton. Have you guys seen it yet? I have I've watched not. half of it. What do you think? Was it good? I mean, it's a great musical. I some of it I feel like is a little revisionist history. I don't think Hamilton was that great of a guy. I don't either. But yeah. I, you know, I feel like um, the guy that made it, Lin Manuel Miranda, he's pretty open to saying like, yes, please critique how Hamilton. Okay portrayed like it's definitely open to that so yeah well I'll, uh yeah i'll let you guys know what i think um i've been looking forward to it i'm kind of uh disappointed i haven't seen it yet so man i want to talk more lost cause <laughs> hey, <laughs> just got fired up. Are, we, are we gonna need to do a, a part 2.2 2 or two to two I'm, and a half i'm after, done after talking about them. I'm yes. done talking about gods and generals. I don't ever want to think about this. Well, well, okay. Like, I just, just sort of want to say in closing, and this is going back to my opening remarks about this, about the fact that I feel like the focus on military history kind of uh, uh, erases, in a way, the roles of uh, African Americans, Black Americans. Definitely. In war, and, and in American history. There's only one Black man in Gettysburg, a runaway slave, Right, and then we have the characters in Gods and Generals who are these ridiculous characters, pretty much. But that it's just it's appalling. I will it is. Add- and was it Gettysburg that they were that the South was uh, uh, kidnapping free blacks and selling them into slavery? Yeah, yeah. Well, they yeah. should have included right. that. That is one thing that is missing from this. From the, the, the Confederate invasion of the North, is that right? They were capturing freedmen and sending them back south. Mm-hmm. And also they had attendants too. They had slaves with them. You don't see them anywhere in those films. Well, That's other true. than the characters. Well, see one one way or another, those people will be free. <laughs> Stonewall, he said that to Jim. Yeah. Did, like Stonewall Jackson had slaves. We we don't see them. Like he would have had house mm-hmm. servants. They're not in the movie. And I'll mm-hmm. also point out Gettysburg has the one black character and he has no lines. Right. Like there to be the example, the like what are we fighting for moment and then they move on. Right. Which, it's important like that we watch Glory and 12 Years a Slave, which do tell the Black American experience during Civil War time stories. Well, you guys want to do that one next? Yeah, I mean, we can. All right. Yeah, let's do that. I will, uh, I'll watch Glory this week. I've been wanting to rewatch that. I haven't oh, seen so it. so good. Yeah. So good. I haven't seen it. Man, it's probably been maybe whew, more than five years. So, um, I caught part of it on like a TV or HBO. It was like a, a brief clip. So uh, that'll be that'll be good. And uh, I'll reach out to you guys about schedule, get it scheduled up. And uh, these are great co- talks. I really appreciate you guys. I just, I just want to say one last thing. Yes, sir. Okay. Gettysburg, right? You had the, uh, uh, the, the Chamberlain speech, right? Where he gives all these reasons that they're fighting the war, right? Even one of them's boredom. Hey, maybe some of us were bored and that's why we came along, but we knew we were doing the right thing, right? And then later on, and and it's the same way in Gods and Generals too, we're all fighting for our rights. We're fighting for our Virginia, right? The Union, we're fighting for many. The Confederacy, we're fighting for few. Thank you, good night. Bam, all right. (laughs)
All right, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to our next one. And I've, I've been getting a lot of positive feedback about uh, anytime we've done anything. So I guess we should keep it up. Oh, I love it, man. I love it. All right. <laughs> Me it's too, so man. Sad. I really do. I, I do like uh, getting people that like to can collaborate. You know, it's, it's nice to have the same sort of energy. So um, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you, Brian. Have, Enjoy have a great your weekend. Dinner. See you, Jules. Yes, I will. Bye. Bye.